It's time for Thriller Thursdays here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. The Casebook of Justice and Dixon. The Case of the North Pole Gang, Part 1. The name is Justice. Jack Justice. December is the cruelest month, my friends. There are certain persons who shall remain, T.S. Eliot, who would have you believe otherwise, citing lilacs and an earth emerging from forgetful snow, and other arguments in favor of other pages of the word-a-day calendar which I had spent the past eleven months barely tolerating. It would do you well to remember that the same argumentative poet spent a measurable number of his days writing poems about cats with stupid names, which makes him objectively wrong about everything, especially this. December is the cruelest month. This is not a point on which I am prepared to yield the slightest ground. There is no other month which even begins to propose that peace on earth and goodwill toward men is even a remote possibility, much less that it is something that might be wished for by a small child trying to ingratiate themselves in a letter to an overweight immortal man who lives with elves. No month could live up to those kind of expectations, and the cruelest month does not even try. I hear you wonder to one another what could have provoked this position. After all, cruel months like December do not apply their cruelty evenly. That would be fair, and fairness is inherently antithetical to the signature trait of this particular month, see cruelty, above. Those who are lost, adrift or alone, feel the pangs of despised love more keenly than others, and it cannot be argued that I am any of those things. Oh, perhaps that might have once been the case. I may have found amongst the ghosts of Christmas's past an occasion to all alone beweep my outcast state and possibly knock off a bottle of ironically named holiday cheer, but not lately, friends, and you need have no fear in that regard. Through luck, or fate, or possibly the direct intervention of a benevolent creator, old Jack Justice found himself these days quite comfortable in the company of something soft and nurse-shaped in an actual little house on a street that went from nowhere to nowhere else all of which was most delightfully out of character. So why the public lamentations as regards your favorite month that is not also mine? Because the holidays are just a terrible time to be a private detective, friends. So much of my trade is dependent upon the circus of human misery that is the modern romance ganged after Glay, and yes, I did just rope Robert Burns into a tirade, which has also included Eliot, Shakespeare, and Dickens, which is a sure sign I need to get to the point and fast. Where was I? Ah, yes. The point is this. After Thanksgiving, the tendency among Mr. and Mrs. soon-to-be-divorced America is to pretend that everything is fine. Nobody wants to face it. Nobody wants to fight it. Everyone just wants to put on a happy face and pretend that somehow a little Christmas magic will make his secretary or her gigolo disappear. And since the first scene of the fifth act of this all-too-common domestic tragedy involves the dramatic entrance of the heroic young private detective, when the production goes on a holiday hiatus, so too does the casework dry up like my Aunt Minerva's holiday turkey. Dead broke and bored out of your mind is no way to ride out the holiday season, even if you do it with the certainty conveyed by long practice that the floodgates will soon open. The cruelest month will end, and the year along with it. And the resolutions to finally find out once and for all will provoke a mad rush of clients keen to help cover the back rent of the mighty world headquarters of Justice and Dixon, Private Investigations. And that is why Wally Beether was currently receiving the time of day from the girl detective and myself as if he were an honored guest. In the Museum of Detective History, which does not exist but should, there must surely be a depiction of the evolution of the gumshoe, from the slope-headed knuckle-dragging lower forms to the lantern-jawed pinnacle of natural selection that is the modern private eye. Somewhere between the lungfish-like forms gasping for breath and the small lemur-like creatures scuttling about the forest floor, we would have the lower form that is the store detective. Not unlike their more evolved cousin, the hotel detectives, the store dicks are employed by a single commercial enterprise to enforce their own vision of law and order upon a world of chaos. The hotel boys, of course, were chiefly there to maintain a veneer of respectability and keep the tall building full of private rooms and comfy beds from being the obvious dens of iniquity they cannot help but be. 
Their mission put them into direct conflict with some of the most fundamental impulses of humanity, which made them at least a little bit interesting, even if they got no respect from Brother Seamus's in the process. Store detectives were a different animal altogether. They chased shoplifters and mostly did not catch them. However much they may feel entitled to be a part of the investigative fraternity, they deserved nothing of the kind. Wally Beether was a nice enough guy, but he was never going to be an actual private eye and he knew it. But the cruelest month treated him very differently. Our famine was his feast, and he had brains enough to know when he was in over his head. I sure am glad to find you guys are not otherwise engaged, Wally said, breathing heavily through his mouth as he did so, December being so crazy and all. In fact, we find ourselves in something of a quiet spell, Mr. Beether, the girl detective said with a crisp professional manner that both of us knew she was faking. Truth of the matter is, we expect it to last until January if this year is like any other. January, Wally sighed as if it was a beautiful dream that he could only imagine. That's when my life goes back to normal. Most of the time, you see, it's just me and Jimmy the part-time guy, and he's mostly on when I'm not. Two men, one desk, you see. Sounds awkward. But I'm sure you work it out, Trixie said with a nervous glance at her own little desk, which was regimented and compartmentalized within an inch of its life. Just the thought of someone else sitting at it, much less me, made her break out in the cold sweats. She banished such thoughts with a shudder. Sure thing, Wally shrugged. It ain't like there's a lot of sitting involved. You're on your feet, looking for trouble, eyes always open, but I don't have to tell you that, he chuckled modestly. Trixie, who could nap under a newspaper with the very best of them, nodded politely as if she knew exactly what he meant. Of course, Mr. Beether. Ah, jeez, Trixie, there's no need to go all formal-like on me. Wally is fine. He batted his enormous frog-like eyes as if he was genuinely moved by the display of respect, which for all I knew he actually was. It actually helps to keep things a little more formal, Trixie said with a slight shake of her head, when old friends come calling with some work. I raised an eyebrow at the suggestion that Wally Beether qualified as an old friend, but he seemed twice as flattered by that as he had been by the honorific, and I suppose that was the point, so I let it sail past. You have stopped by with some work, haven't you? Trixie said with a hint of hesitation. Well, sure, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know what to think, Wally said, mopping his brow. There isn't trouble at home, is there, Wally? I broke my silence, desperately trying to recall Mrs. Beether's first name before remembering it was ran off six years ago. Awkward. Nah, Jack, Wally said with a dismissive little circular wave of his hands, like a close-up magician trying to distract a mark. Everything at home is just the same. It's the store, you see? I gather it's boom time, I said with a nod. Sure, lots and lots of short-termers in every department. A few work the rush every year, but most are brand new, so they don't know a thing. And they don't care that they don't know it on account of they are scheduled to turn into pumpkins after the Boxing Day sales is over. Wally mopped his brow again. He had refused my initial offer of coffee. But if he kept perspiring like this, he was going to need to replenish fluids soon. It's worse than my department. We go from a couple of men who know what they're doing, know what to watch and how not to look like you're watching it, and how to handle an arrest, nice and quiet-like, to a staff of 20 yahoos who've seen too many pictures. I spend all day running after them, putting out fires. I got no time to do the job Mr. Zwinski's paying me for. I thought old man Zwinski passed on, I frowned. Two years ago, Trixie nodded, and his son went away on an embezzlement charge. Young Master Zwinski is six years old and the heir to the throne, or am I wrong? Nah, that's just right, Baldy beamed. But six or not, he's Mr. Zwinski to me. And when somebody looks to reach into Mr. Zwinski's pocket, you know what they're going to find? Two broken crowns and a bus pass, I offered. They're going to find Wallace P. B. They're ready to teach them a lesson, that's what they're going to find. Wally wheezed, scrubbing his handkerchief again across his ample forehead. Only upon reflection, it seems that I do not know precisely how to do that and could use... He seemed to choke on the words. You could use a little help, Trixie offered with her best non-encouraging smile. Wally nodded. A little help, he agreed. Who couldn't? I made it unanimous. Let's have some coffee. Twenty minutes later, we had coaxed most of the saga from Wally. How the rumors started that there was trouble headed in the direction of Zwinski's department store. Big trouble of the vaguest possible variety. A career shoplifter had tried to use that information to buy their way out of Wally's custody, but it was store policy to prosecute to the full extent of the law, so they were left with no clues and no idea of what might be over the horizon. 
It being the silly season, the Human Resources Department had advanced Wally the funds they felt necessary to deal with an open-ended threat to the security of the city's second biggest retail giant, and everyone regarded that as a job well done. Everyone except Wally, who had no idea what to do next. He could stand watch with the best of them, but if he didn't know what he was watching for, he was lost. As far as I'm concerned, the customers are no more of a threat than they ever were, Wally said, talking with his hands in spite of the cup of my finest blend that threatened to wash over him like a tidal wave with every oversized gesture. I mean, shoplifting ain't exactly a group activity, is it? Is it? I asked no one in particular. No, Trixie said, carefully shutting me down before I could get started. But if you don't take the rumors seriously, then where do we come in? Oh, they take it serious, Trixie, Wally shook his head. This next month is pretty much our entire year. We can't take no chances. But the customers I can handle. 22 years I've seen just about anything they can dish out, but they ain't the real threat. Trixie and I exchanged a look that confirmed neither one of us could guess where he was going with this, and we turned back to our guest and waited patiently. The staff, he said, baffled at our obtuseness. The short-termers. Oh, said Trixie sagely, the staff. The short-termers, I agreed. Now you see, Wally said pleased, although we didn't really. Every year from Thanksgiving on, the staff more than doubles. The customers are just on the floor. The staff goes everywhere and does anything. And you suspect them, I offered, of what exactly? I don't know, Wally said. Something big. Something that Zwinski's is going to feel for years is what my guy said. Your guy who you arrested rather than trade with, I asked. The fullest extent of the law, Wally said, his face an impassive mask. If I started making deals with creeps like that, you know what I'd have? A clue of where to start? I shrugged. Anarchy! Wally said seriously. I'd have every scale I ever ran off descend on us like a pack of hyenas. If there's something happening on the floor, I'll see it. If there's something brewing in the back halls, well, that's what I got you for. And here we had at last arrived to the rub of the matter. Human resources had given Wally a budget to work with to protect Zwinskis from a fate worse than death, whatever that might be, and he, bless his little socks, had elected to spend it hiring someone who could actually do some detecting, namely the girl detective and myself. It required some adjustment of our usual pay scale, mostly in that there was no provision for expenses, but otherwise it sounded like the softest December in history. We walk amongst the seas of temporary workers at Zwinski's department store, discover nothing very interesting is happening because it almost certainly isn't, and collect as many days of profitable labor as we could before someone realized it was all a terrific waste of time and money, which it almost certainly was. We followed Wally downtown in my car. I was enthused. Trixie was less so. What are you so sour about, I asked. This is candy from a baby. Why would a baby even have candy in the first place, she scowled. I shrugged. That's a real interesting point, Trixie. I'll get right on that mystery first thing in the new year. Meanwhile, we're about to get flush for the first December I can remember, and you're acting like somebody just stole your fruitcake. You want to tell me why? Because if I wanted to work in a shop, I would work in a shop, Jack, she snapped. We won't be working in a shop, I protested. We'll be pretending to work in a shop. We'll be blending in. You know how we'll be blending in, genius, she scowled. Through cunning and guile, I offered. By working in a shop. She said, her eye roll almost audible. Trix, any working we do will be completely incidental. Gosh, Jack, how will you tell it from a regular day at the office? I gave her that one on points, but I was not prepared to concede the match. Because I will be paid for my time, Madam Sourpuss, I said, and not the rates the gals and ladies wear are making. This is a corporate gig funded by a department that's too busy to care and overseen by an incompetent. This is the mother load. I've worked in retail, Jack, she admitted, a haunted look in her eyes. At Christmas, too. You won't like it. Trixie, how many times do I have to tell you they aren't going to make us work in the shop? I said, as if it was the end of the conversation, which it was, until 15 minutes later when Wally Beather handed me a pair of coveralls and a mop. It's the perfect cover, he said, looking pleased with his own cunning. You can go anywhere and observe anyone. It's more than I dared to dream, I said, which was true. Trixie looked as pleased with herself as I have ever seen her, and that was saying something. Remember, Wally continued, you report to me, but as far as anyone is concerned, you're just regular temp staffers. No one will ever guess we aren't really janitors, I promised. Yes, Trixie agreed, because you'll be mopping things. We'll be mopping things, you mean, I insisted desperately. Well, Jack, 
I don't think we'd get away with that, Wally said, making the girl detectives grin even wider. A man with a mop can blend in. A girl like Trixie, she don't blend. So I'm putting her where the action is. The grin faded away. Dear God, no, she whispered. I shifted to see what Wally had in his hand. It was a clothes hanger, bearing the most adorable little tight sweater elf costume you ever did see, complete with jingle bells on the hat and the curly shoes. Little Miss Naughty List was going to help Santa. God bless us, everyone, I said. This is Thursday Thrillers, audio with action on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow on Mutual with Friday Follies, the end of the week collection of comedy cut ups. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or find the Friday Follies feed in your favorite podcast players. Now that's a lot of F's. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.